Hello, I'm M Hotep, and welcome to this episode of the Egyptian Magic Podcast. I'm Mog Morgan, uh, companion of Set and Knight of Shambhala. I'm going to return to a subject of the Netflix, having recently lectured to the um, Netflix Anthropology Conference. Short thing. Uh, so some of the material might have. Uh, dealt with before but I think it's worth returning to it's an interesting topic and there's a kind of lot of magic in it um, I've so I've discovered it is actually it's pretty central to magic uh, according to the, some of the things I've discovered so I think it's okay and, and new things are being discovered all the time I should say that um, I talked to them before about um, because the, the the conference they'd asked me to kind of specifically to look at uh, Egyptian magic and Egyptian culture and see if there was any reflection there of the um, myth of the Nephilim that you find in the in the Bible, which I'm not going to go into the precise details of that. But anyway, I kind of I did that, uh, and I thought I'd take a little bit for last time I as you say I looked at its Egyptian origins when I started out I didn't really fi- expect to find much but but there's actually quite a lot right and it enables me to say really that we're talking about an Egyptian myth essentially when you're talking about the the net flume. they may not use that precise term uh, it definitely has Egyptian origins and an Egyptian um, reverence really and basically last time I talked about uh, the Egyptian priestly historian Manitho and I talked a little bit about some of the records found at the Temple of Horus at Edfu uh, that seem to allude to this kind of ancient story really so I didn't want to repeat that that's probably in some one of the other podcasts as well but um, if people say that they'd like to hear that again I can do that so this time I wanted to talk about uh, new discoveries and ideas relating to the most famous monuments in Egypt, really, things like the pyramids and the Sphinx and also the whole monument field that you find at uh, Abydos in Upper Egypt, really, or Central Egypt, if you like. And and I wanted to show how there's a... Obviously, that's a kind of popular thing. Everybody likes to talk about the pyramids. It's almost if you if you're interested in this subject matter at all, people always want to know what your opinion is on the Sphinx and the pyramids, um, but, but uh, I thought, but there is a connection, right? There is a way of weaving them into the story that's not too contrived, I hope you're fine. Uh, there is actually a set of illustrations that goes with this, and uh, you can, it should make sense just as a, a spoken word podcast, but if you have time, do check out the YouTube version, which has all the, the pictures that I'm going to look at as I go through and uh, whatever. Anyway, as I say, anybody exploring this uh, territory has to sort of deal with the, the Pyramid and the Sphinx. I wanted to talk about a new discovery, though, which was um, specifically the Nous of the Decades, which is a bit of a mouthful, I know, but it's, a, it's an astronomical uh, monument from Egypt that was discovered... Uh, submerged right in off the coast of of Alexandria in a lost city a city of Heraklion which was lost in an ancient tsunami which I suppose you'd say that's a, certainly a ironic right that given that the Nephilim myth takes us into the era of floods and myths of great floods and buried uh, kingdoms and, and all the rest that because off the coast of Egypt, there really is a lost city uh, buried beneath the ocean by a, a, a tsunami. And this, this monument also is of, it's quite small. It's about the size of an average wardrobe. And it's an astronomical monument. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting one. It's one of the first... I suppose you say horoscopes in a way. It's a, really it, it does have a horoscope, but it's uh, I allude to a particular astronomical time. But it's doing that as a kind of act of magic, 
and this thing was obviously part of a there were four of them I think originally and they were they were arranged in this kind of mandala uh, as a piece of battle magic and by pretty much one of Egypt's last native pharaohs uh, who was battling against the Persians and uh, for a while it did sort of work but work or not eventually it ended up broken up by later people and thrown into the sea uh, or m maybe it w maybe at the same time but it as well as the astronomical data it has cosmological data and this is I think this needs emphasizing because this is very orthodox maybe some of the other sources that we talked about in Egypt and everywhere needs a lot of interpretation they're quite sort of especially Manitho maybe you, you have to kind of work quite hard to fit it with uh, with some of these these old myths and the, even the history of Egypt um, Edfu thing takes a lot of interpretation it's, it's it's quite a complex document but this this one had the kind of quite a, a, a clear statement on it and it's part of a temple and it's, it's very kind of uh, pucker if you like and it says at the beginning of finite time eh, the beginning of time really as this was envisaged by the Egyptians at the beginning of time there were four generations of disorganized gods and goddesses and this they assisted before the well-known god Shu of the ap atmosphere raised the sky for the first time so it's a direct reference this is obviously part of Egyptian uh, theology that there was a time before time before space and time actually got going and that but there were entities in existence then four generations of them in fact with four being a very interesting number as well uh, that existed in a previous before time you can't say a previous time because there's, there's a visitors before time or another time if you like another time and dimension so this is the way they looked at it uh, they raise the sky and sh the sun is able to shine and uh, and be measured across certain landscape points in Egypt. It also mentions that in the text, very, very interesting. I thought it was also, given that I argued that the Nephilim, uh, uh, something to do with an Egyptian word, Shebtui, the submerged ones, those who have been submerged beneath the Great Flood, Whereas the literal meaning of Nephilim, I think, is uh, or Nephal is to fall down, and then by extension, to, uh, giant. Uh, but I, to my mind, the idea of falling down and also maybe being imprisoned in the earth or under the earth is not such a stretch to that, and the idea of being submerged below the ocean, below the cosmic ocean, be, below the first oceans. Um, and it's interesting how a lot of these new monuments that we're kind of interpreting and trying to weave into the story and has given us new information come from a, bury, uh, a submerged city as well. Not the one in historical time, not what, not the one from this previous age when there was some sort of cosmic battle, essentially. That's what they're alluding to. Uh, but even so, the irony is there. So a rather extraordinary place um, and colossal architecture also submerged by Heraklion and I suppose we get used to the idea that just because that, that something built on a large scale is just that's just an, uh, that's nothing but it's good it's interesting of course but there's probably there's a certain element of what you might call intention to that which we tend to overlook um, it's, it's part of the message and it's interesting that the Sphinx itself, which uh, we're going to talk about the Sphinx Enigma, is probably the largest piece of uh, sculpture, or the first of, a, of the large pieces of sculpture that the Egyptians made. Um, you know, so there's a certain experimental quality to that, and as is well known, it's a kind of bit, it's huge, uh, but it's also a little bit out of proportion. Uh, it's got a kind of human head on a lion's body. Uh, and Egyptians at that stage, because it was the first attempt, hadn't quite mastered the convention of how to do that without it looking 
kind of strange to a head too small so they worked that out um, and so, so usually I know that the first question probably going through your mind everybody's mind is how old are the pyramids or specifically how old is the sphinx usually people kind of approach you you know like the ancient mariner or something and they, they say oh are you one of these do you think they might be prehistoric 10,000 years old or built uh, I suppose 8,000 10,000 be before the modern era uh, I have to say I don't I don't really follow that point of view although I'm not disparaging of it but uh, I think I've found a way they actually the story of the Netflix and the Egyptian equivalents kind of makes make sense of why people think that might be the case if you like why the egyptians kind of did this in a way but built this kind of enigma into all of their monuments that make them look either make them look older or make them kind of point back to a a very very old period in their in their history anyway you can google and look at the image of the nous of the decades it's, it's quite a complicated issue maybe i'll I sh and there's a lot of magic and interesting stuff in that bit. Uh, there's a picture in the, on my film, and you can you can find images there. But you probably probably needs a bit of work to make sense of this. So the pyramids and the Sphinx. Um, I I also think my my view of the, the the Sphinx, which I would probably follow essentially following the more orthodox view that it is built by the Egyptians at the same time as the pyramids but i don't think what i'm going to what i'm going to say or what i've said before it disenchanting in some ways it takes the magic away i think it kind of restores the magic it shows you where the magic really is and how we connect that with the things that we do now um, what we make of that so i think it's more magical but obviously we have to be aware that the there was th that theory about the extreme age, the pre-Egyptian origin of the Sphinx comes famously from John Anthony West, who I think has passed over now, in 1979, in his book The Serpent of the Sky. And they pointed, he, he and another uh, collaborator, they, they looked at the Sphinx uh, excavation and they said you can see from the water damage that's occurred on the side there that when did that happen that that for some reason that points to kind of him being not Egyptian in you know, some ancient time although I suppose the obvious question is oh how do you know it wasn't raining <laughs> you know when they built it there were there, there wasn't a lot of water around <laughs> uh, I put that to someone and they were they were okay about it they accepted that they said yeah well of course that could be true in fact the pyramids themselves so I was told they show a lot of other uh, evidence of damage from sedimentation and uh, water damage, if you like, the kind of uh, salts coming out of solution and stuff, it packed with salt, I was told. Uh, so, because if you look at any pictures, if you look at especially area pictures of the, as the Sphinx, as I pointed out a few times, you'll notice that um, it's not in a kind of regular oblong quarry as you would expect a certain amount of symmetry it's kind of a bit of a trapezoid shape showing all the erosion and everything and and it's got this strange shape because it allows for a causeway uh, to pass along one side to the pyramid of Caffrey uh, so unless you have some really weird uh, kind of fix for a workaround for that, it, it, it looks as if the Sphinx and the and the pyramid behind it is built at the same time. It's sort of incorporating one within the other. So if you're going to put one to back in time to a different date to ten thousand BC or whatever it is, you're going to have to probably do that with the pyramid. Uh, and people do, in fact. They try and say that the entire pyramid complex is much older than Egypt, built by some unknown prehistoric culture or even by aliens. It's, it's not impossible. Uh, 
that's where that line of reasoning tends to lead. But I kind of uh, suggest another thing, really, uh, about all of this. Uh, my solution, if you like, to why there are these enigmas, undoubtedly in the site, and that's uh, I've only mentioned one or two of them. There's the issue of, if you look at any of the famous cross sections of, uh, of the pyramid of Khufu, for instance, You'll see, which is the when you, you you'll see famously there are these three chambers. There's what's called the king's chamber, where 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 there's a, a remains of a sarcophagus where the main burial was supposed to be. There's a a lower chamber beneath that which has been named the queen's chamber, but it wouldn't have been the queen's chamber. Queens weren't buried in the same pyramid. They had their own pyramids, satellite pyramids, if you like, uh, nearby. Uh, plus it's a much smaller uh, chamber, not, not maybe not completely suitable for a burial in the way that the king's chamber was. And then there's a, a third chamber as well, which is deep underground. Almost as if they, they started, one idea is they started building this thing, the pyramids, uh, Pyramid itself and the underground, uh, what was going to be the tomb, and for some reason, either they stopped and left it in this uh, sort of half-made condition, or even that that looks as maybe that's from another time as well. Maybe that really is because it looked it's made to look as if it is very very older than everything else around it and whatever. Just like, like some of the architecture in other parts of the pyramid complex, it's, it kind of looks different. So you can't really blame people for saying, well, how do you explain that? How, how would you explain the fact that it's got this bit of it that looks old? Um, I suppose my solution essentially is that the Egyptians did it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> they deliberately wanted to give it this look of um, of an antiquity even for them. So they now that that might sound a bit bit almost as arbitrary as some of the other theories, but I I think when you realise when you look for that you that that idea recurs in several other monuments. I'd say all other monuments, in fact, in Egypt, that there's always an archaic bit. There's always a bit where there's a kind of a bit of a mind game uh, or puzzle uh, taking place. So that that's my solution uh, to kind of say that we we do need. Something I talked about last time was this discovery, recent discovery on the Egypt's Red Sea coast. They found because you know when you if you were lucky enough to go to Egypt, you 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 might go on a tour. It used to be the old Egyptian uh, museum, and and the guys have to kind of they always take you to the show you this kind of stuff from the old kingdom and they show you a tiny little statue of uh, Khufu, I mean, literally tiny, just a few centimetres high. And they say that's pretty much all there is, right, that connects uh, this pharaoh Khufu with this um, with this great pyramid. There's, there was nothing else found that really connects them together. Uh, anyway, that situation has changed, basically, uh, and they've discovered on Egypt's Red Sea coast uh, a harbour and all sorts of a quarry and pits basically very like uh, yeah boat pits or caves in which uh, Egyptian boats were placed for when they weren't being used in the seasons and even right and that architecture in fact of these these things which you can check online uh, also looks very like the boat boat pits that you find around uh, around the pyramids, the, the the great colossal architecture and all the rest. But interesting as well, pro probably more important than uh, the stone architecture. They found a papyrus, the oldest papyrus ever found now in Egypt, which they've called the uh, 
Red Sea Papyrus. On the face of it, not the most interesting of things, but in other ways, fascinating uh, account of how these people, these mariners, Egyptian mariners, what how their year went, what they were there to do, and, and what their what they did, and you know from that that they worked for Khufu, and you know that part of their job was ferrying stuff across to the Sinai to get copper, but also another part of their job was was working on the Nile near near the Great Pyramids, and ferrying the stones from the quarry at Tura to the pyramid site. So the, these are actually Khufu's work, work forces. And you also know from their records uh, that the whole area was a natural harbour. The whole area was flooded. At some point, the, the Sphinx area doesn't appear to have even been made, uh, the, the last thing. But certainly, almost where the Sphinx is, all around that area, and it was, it was kind of higher ground, was flooded with water from and the Nile itself flowed quite close by so it could easily be diverted and extended to make a, a huge natural harbour around the Sphinx period, uh, place at, uh, at Giza so that the workmen could live and deliver the stone that was being built and a colossal amount of stone according to the, the records I mean almost every uh, several stones every hour uh, which you would expect of course so I think in a way the issue of whether Khufu is connected with this pyramid and, and how they built the pyramid is kind of sorted now we can almost leave that area behind so I think my my solution is saying within that uh, historical time frame you've still got this enigma of why then are they using uh, referring to a previous time to this generation this archaic time even before the the Egyptians were there why are they referring to that and do they do it anywhere else okay so in answer to that question do they do it somewhere else right do do do, do is this a pattern? Have we identified a pattern? This archaizing, archaic tendency of, of the Egyptians. And of course, I would say the best example of that, or, or a very good example, actually, since I've been researching this, I've kind of found interesting examples from all over, uh, which need to be discussed in their own right, really, because they're incredibly magical things. But just to remind you that one of the best examples of, of that would be the Temple of Seti the I at Abydos, of course, which is a fairly familiar monument, and you should be able to find uh, pictures of that. Abydos was the kind of uh, very, very early um, royal cemetery and, uh, for Egypt. The, the kings of the very first dynasties of Egypt were probably buried there. And even in light, later times when people had moved the kind of royal uh, headquarters to either to, uh, you know, to, to what is now now the Giza area or moved it to Luxor or whatever, they always wanted to kind of touch base, if you like, with, with the Abydos area, which is an incredible sacred site uh, in the ancient world, a place of pilgrimage and all the rest. Uh, an enormous necropolis, all sorts of things there. Uh, and the cult, famously the cult centre of one of Egypt's most famous gods, the god Osiris uh, of the underworld. And indeed, the entrance to the underworld is there, <laughs> in a sense, at, at, at Abydos. The reason, one of the reasons probably why they built uh, this, this huge royal cemetery there is because it has this natural phenomena of a kind of cleft in the in the Nile escarpment, which you can see leading to the west, and then through this cleft, which has also a name Peg of the Gap and all the rest, it kind of leads you into the deep desert, and in which is the place of the unconscious and also of the underworld. So there is this natural phenomena that obviously drew people to the area. 
and one of the world's masterpieces is the Temple of Seti the First at Abydos. And even though he wasn't one of the, he, he's a he's a king of the New Kingdom. He, but there's this kind of elaborate game played in this uh, in this temple, not unlike the game that's played at Giza. Uh, you've got this wonderful temple, and and the, from studying the architecture, it becomes of this idea. You get this idea. They start building the temple, and at some point, the builders hit a a problem. There's a problem. Uh, they have to stop building in the normal style which is this long out football field sized temple long oblong and all the other things they have to stop because they find something is already there and not something that they can kind of get rid of in a sense they feel that they found the the original tomb of the god Osiris uh, buried there so naturally they can't just get rid of it they, uh, they don't want to build on top of it which might have been one solution so they they kind of change the design of the temple and head off in another direction uh, head south so so and they finish the temple off in this in the southern quarter so they can leave this area mostly untouched and this of course is the famous Osirion, or a good name for this now is the Resurrection Chamber. Uh, it, it's hard to underestimate how important this particular monument is, not just for Egypt, for for all of us, for who who are interested in magic and the esoteric tradition. It strangely it plays a role in all of my subsequent <laughs> magic not mess not necessarily under that name but some sort of resurrection chamber it gives rise to the idea of um, alchemy directly alchemy starting in egypt connected with this object uh, and it and you can see other things i i did last time about tra this is issue of transformational images uh, as in the tarot and how they kind of Heart back to this particular monument, a fascinating thing in its own right, and we will pro we will explore that a, a lot in future times. But I just wanted to mention that it was there, uh, and it's it's a kind of it's the place where uh, Osiris was killed or drowned really it's full of water even though we're kind of quite a long way from the Nile when you get to Abydos it's flooded and it's full of water and has to be pumped out regularly the architecture is different to the new kingdom stuff it looks very like old kingdom architecture it looks like the sort of thing you might find at the at the base of the pyramids in fact it it's it's got all sorts like, like a kind of mystery place. Obviously, some sort of mystery cult was celebrated there. It's got incredible um, astrological things carved onto the walls, and it's got a, a remarkable history. But the thing I kind of wanted to underline is that it isn't an old building. It's built at the same time as the main temple that is supposed to have changed direction. The whole thing is built as one monument. Uh, and in fact even when they were building changing the, the design of the main temple they kind of blocked some rooms off uh, to make it look as if the architects oh well we can't use that bit of masonry anymore because we've got to kind of change direction because of this thing but this was all a game none of that was true it was all as far as I know it was all built at exactly the same moment this archaic piece of architecture and the, the the New Kingdom temple. So there's a second example, at least, right, of this feature of uh, Egyptian theology, for want of a better word, is that you you always have to have an archaic underground place. Underground. And... This refers to an ancient time. It refers to 
the time of essentially of the Nephilim, or well, what would be called the Nephilim in, in the Bible, but they have another name for it, the Sheb too. It's referring to the ancient civilization, the disorganized gods and goddesses, if you like, who in the story never completely die or are destroyed in the, in the process. They're buried or submerged by the, by the flood. And, but they're not killed. Uh, very few entities are actually killed within Egyptian mythology, but they kind of suffer, right? They're, 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 they're ambiguous entities as well. They've kind of got lots of good qualities. Uh, and maybe they're, they're, well, it says they're disorganized, so maybe that's a, a chaotic in, in some ways. But the point is that, that, that they have, even though they've fallen and they've been submerged and, and uh, they're under the ground and they're referenced uh, in many, many other temples as well, this underground st structure, this subterranean life of, that you find in all Egyptian temples, they retain a certain power. In fact, they, they have a certain latent power that is drawn upon in by by the te the later temple itself so that's why they're there the later temple needs to have it needs to have it there it's it's like a black box if you like or a battery a psychic battery maybe or whatever the buried uh, entities under the temple or under the pyramid or uh, uh, in connection with it a part of the power structure of the temple itself and resurrection chamber. This is again is connected with a very very old piece of uh, magic within within Egypt. This this tradition of of uh, power that can be somehow drawn upon to to by the living uh, and and the subsequent death generations to continue the, the the process. Right. I was lucky enough to visit the Asarion in. Abydos, you can't always guarantee that you'll do that. It just depends on conditions. An incredibly remarkable building uh, whenever it was built. Even more remarkable in a way when you know that it has this this history. Okay. So... Just to finish then... My kind of interpretation of, of, of this material, this sort of, uh, is important to the uh, Egyptian way of looking at things, is um, it's not peripheral, right? It makes more sense of it, but also it brings it back to life. It, it makes sense of, of a lot of things that we do within magic in terms of... Um, Kind of referring back, we, the four, the fact that we kind of always have build this structure, this four square structure, and something above, but also something beneath us. There's something beneath us that we kind of draw the power into us, and this is what what this is how magic works now. Uh, and when we work magic this way, when we kind of think about it this way, we're closer to. Uh, really understanding how the Egyptians practice their magic. Anyway, I think that's that's enough to be thinking of. So whenever you do your magic, you have your four square, you have your above, below, and your center. So, Senapti, and speak to you next time.